started again. Just to let you know, um, we're going to be starting with some prizes from here on in. Um, so we're going to have the next lecture and then we will just take uh, a lucky draw from a hat. And we either, you're going to, we've got uh, a jacket to give away and we've got um, some overnight stays at a five-star country lodge uh, in Irene. Uh, so lots to follow. Please uh, keep your attention levels up. Um, our next speaker, uh, if you all can take your seats. Our next speaker is Dr. Tom Hyde. Um, Dr. Tom Hyde has lived an interesting life. He has spent five years in the U.S. Marine Corps and did one tour in Vietnam as a, pl a platoon sergeant. He graduated from Florida State University and majored in biology and education. His minors were chemistry and psychology in 1973. He spent five years, uh, sorry, um, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Hyde graduated from Logan College of Chiropractic in 1977. He subsequently obtained a diplomat from the American Chiropractic Board of Sports Physicians. Dr. Hyde has practiced in Miami, Florida, prior to moving to Asheville, North Carolina, where he now lives with his wife, Susan. He authored and published two textbooks, um, two textbook editions with Marion Gingenbach, Conservative Managers, Management of Sports Injuries, both in 1996 and 2006. Dr. Hyde has traveled all over the uh, US and all over the world, treating top athletes. He is a Hall of Fame member in the American Chiropractic Council on Sports, Inju sports Injuries and Physical Fitness. Additionally, he is a member of the Professional Football Chiropractic Society. He was awarded an honorary fellow of the Royal Canadian Chiropractic Sports Sciences. His hobbies are traveling around the world, hiking, climbing, golf. Yeah, good man. <laughs> golf, fishing, and especially outdoor landscape, including wildlife photography. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Tom Hyde. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm, I don't know why, but I get embarrassed, thank you, when, when I hear that. Um, I'm just old, you know, and been around a long time, so. And every once in a while, as they say, we have a saying that even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while, an acorn. So I've been fortunate in, in my career, and I've had a, a, a great one, and um, I'm absolutely delighted more than you'll ever know to be here at this Congress this weekend, and I can't thank you all for allowing me to come and present today and then tomorrow. So I applaud and thank all of you very much for that opportunity. And this afternoon, don't miss these two wonderful people here in the front row uh, when they come in and deliver a little radiology for us. So I'll start today, and I'm going to skip a few slides. Uh, I've decided to, to change it up a little bit, but you're going to have a copy of the presentation. So you, you don't have to worry about that too much. You'll have all of that given to you. And I thought I would uh, get into a few things that are kind of new in the f world of fascia and show you a couple of things. And uh, then I want to do a little demonstration, if that's OK with you, so that I'll have somebody up here. And it's not quite as boring as sitting and listening to me lecture the entire time. So I'll do a little of that for you, show you a kind of a little different way. How many of you have taken instrument-assisted soft tissue mobilization of some kind before? Great. How many of those hands are a Graston technique? How many have taken the factor class? Ah, oh, great. Is that with uh, Knothead from Houston? The big guy? Yeah, that was probably him, right? Okay. So anyhow, I hope you learned something from him. I don't, I don't know if you did, but I hope you did. So did you enjoy the concept of FACTOR, though? But the good thing about FACTOR, for those of you who don't know, it stands for Functional and Kinetic Treatment with Rehab. So what we did when we were originally doing Grassen technique, everything was taught in static positions. But we know that motion is life, right? So if you can't move an arm, you can't bend over, you can't do things. 
that's what we decided, well, why do we treat someone in a static position if they can't bend forward? Let's have them reactivate what they can't do and then try to treat them in the position of provocation. Does that make sense to all of you? So it doesn't matter whether it's a shoulder you can't move, an elbow, whatever, we're going to put you in a position of provocation. So there are different parts to that. Uh, and the pain, or the treatment, by the way, is, is predicated on not just pain. So it's loss of function, loss of range of motion, pain, or the tissue feels tight when you try to move something, it just feels tight, doesn't want to go, or I'm palpating it, and that tissue feels tight. So those are the criteria for treating people. And then again, we're going to go through a series of different things. And uh, I've got um, a stability pad here. I'll show you a little bit of treatment of, uh, of a spine uh, using proprioception. Or we'll use a little flex bar to give you a little proprioceptive training when you're doing different things like that. So we'll incorporate a few different things. I'm going to go the next slide, if I could, please. Now, are you going to change it, or do I do it? You're changing. OK. I can't change it here? OK. All right, so let's go to the next one. Oh, forward it goes. OK. Ah, ah good. So let's go down here. I've, I've got a couple of things up here for you. The Fascial Research Society. How many of you have uh, ever heard of the Fascial Research Society? OK, <laughs> Chris. So two of you out of the audience, I think I saw. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, over the last 15 years or so, we've learned so much about fascia. And this is an organization that uh, is worldwide where they have all disciplines who do research in fascia. And it's their findings. Those of you who've done dissection, do you remember cutting through fascia and things like that? And, and when we did it, you just discarded it. It was just a connective tissue that you discarded. Now we're finding out so much more about fascia, and to me it's what we call fascinating. And <laughs> so, sorry about that little pun, but it really is when you think about it because of all the things that it does now that we didn't know about before. So when I treat a spine-related injury now, I'm not going to just look at the joints and the nerve supply and things like that. I'm also going to look at the connectability of that fascia and the role that that fascia plays in our pain or our loss of function or dysfunction. So we're going to cover that a little bit for you. So the Fascial Research Society next meeting, and they only meet every two to three years, will be in Berlin in November. So if you, you can also join the society. I think it's, um, it might be too expensive for you. I think it's 125 US dollars a year. <laughs> So it's probably too much, but uh, it's a great site because they have a lot of articles and all these uh, new uh, research projects that are going on and the data that they're gathering is on there and it gives you a lot of information. Um, but what I can do, since I'm a member, if I find something interesting, I can always forward it. You guys can forward it to each other. Would that be okay? So that way it saves you the cost of going on there and do that. So I'll do that for you. Just remind me, Michael, and I'll do that. Core, uh, that's an app that I use. And Core is, um, it lists all of the uh, orthopedic tests for every part of the body. So when you pull it up, it has a skeleton. So if I want to look at the spine, I just, I can click on the cervical spine. And the cervical spine comes up with all the orthopedic tests. Now it'll go for testing for uh, neurological dysfunction or ranges of motion or all these things and then it lists all of those tests then you can click on a test when you click on the test it shows you a video of that test and it talks to you so it tells you how to perform it what you're looking for and then you can also get the positive and negative predictive values of that along with the specificity and sensitivity of the test and it has links to PubMed so you can pull up each article on that uh, app. Now, that app is US is $39. It's a one time fee. But it's a really good app to have. And if you're caught, you're just not sure about something sometimes, you can go to that. And it, it, it just a, a plethora of information on it. Strolling under the skin, we're going to show you that in just a moment. Uh, how many of you have heard of Jean Claude Guillaume Berteau? Okay, well, he's a. <laughs> An interesting man, he's a, um, 
plastic surgeon in France, and he took a camera and inserted it in a human and magnified fascia. So you can see what's happening to fascia real time. So we're going to show that in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, but he's one of the presenters, and it's unbelievable what you'll see in this. It's a short four-minute little thing we'll do. Then spine-health.com is a free site. You can go to that site, and it's pretty much anything that you want to know about treating the spine. It's free. Uh, they have their board consists of neurosurgeons, uh, neurologists, orthopedic surgeons, chiropractors, athletic trainers, uh, just about any branch, radiologists, neuroradiologists, all these people are part of that that contribute to that website. And again, you can go there, it's free. They have another one, Arthritis-Health. It's the same company. It was started by an orthopedic surgeon in Chicago. And his uh, uh, sister did the website. But on the, the arthritis, it's all kinds of things that deal with arthritis. Treatment, in addition to differential diagnosis, all those things are on that site. And then sports-health is just what it says about that. It's about sports injuries, treatment, conservative, other types of treatment. So it's a nice site, and that's free as well. And if we could go to the first video now, if you wouldn't mind. That's it. This is strolling under the skin. This is only four minutes, four minutes, 15 seconds. Forces on the tissue space. Thanks to these three movements of the labial properties, the microvacuole can therefore adapt to all mechanical solicitations in the three dimensions of space while keeping its volume. The movement of one of these structures influences the other and by connection maintains form and tissue integrity, dissipating from the slightest to the most violent forces. Thanks to this multiple microvacular structure, all the distortions are made possible in three dimensions. Our bodies, our forms, can then be described using this mobile inner architecture, which introduces a real structural ontology. The movement of the tendon, which without any influence on nearby tissue, ensures an optimal, almost frictionless sliding movement, as well as simple gestures such as pinching or stretching the skin with the ability to slide back to its original position can be logically explained. But this global observation of living matter 
based on a microfibrillar and multi-microvacuola inner architecture, has its anatomic limits. This limit is the skin, the border between me and others, between two worlds. Anyhow, you get an idea of fascia, what it looks like real time. And isn't that interesting when you stretch it beyond a certain point, you get a new uh, cross-link formed real time. So that's why we're looking at fascia as one of these causes of pain. We also know fascia has uh, its own nerve supply, its own blood supply, its own lymphatic. It has the ability, as you just saw, to expand or contract. Uh, so they're now classifying that as an organ. So uh, it's gaining popularity, and I think it's not going to be long before many of the textbooks are probably going to then call fascia an organ. If we look at the, the next one, the Fascial Research Society, that's, don't, you don't have to pull that one up now. That's just if you want to go to that site and take a look at it. But let's pull up the last one, if you don't mind. This is a new article that just came out in July. So I'm going to just read a little bit to you here. You have to bear with me. But this is uh, meaning of the solid and the liquid fascia to consider in the model of bias and tensegrity. So initially we thought fascia was this sheet. But now they're saying, well, there's more to it. There's a solid and there's a liquid component to fascia. How many of you have heard that previously? No. So let's just read this. The definition of fascia includes tissues of mesodermal, uh, de uh, derivation considered as specialized connective tissue, the blood and lymph. As water shapes rocks, bodily fluids modify the shape and function of bodily structures. Bodily fluids are silent witnesses to mechanotransducive uh, information allowing adaptation, life transporting biomechanical and hormonal signals. While the, the solid fascial tissue divides, uh, supports and connects the different parts of the body system, and the liquid fascia tissue feeds and transports messages from the solid or for the uh, solid fascia. Uh, this article here goes on to describe some of this. So there are three different organizations that classify fascia. And what they've decided is that there are two kinds now, the liquid and the solid portion. So your blood and all of that, the extracellular matrix, this is all part of that. So it's kind of an interesting. Have you seen this previously? So would you think of the blood being part of the fascial system? So obviously it is now. So a lot happens there. And uh, these things transmit along those fibrils you saw. So that's all gone. Now, remember the fascia, I told you, has a nerve supply. So that's also important, isn't it, when we're treating patients with pain, for an example. So if you don't mind, we'll go back to the regular slides now. Or I guess I have the control on that, do I? I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to skip some of these slides if I can get them to come back up here somewhere. There we go. So, yeah, just mechanisms. I think most of you all know that. If you look at the USA, this is just on uh, spinal cord injuries alone. Motor vehicle accidents, 44%, almost 45% roughly. Falls, violence. Isn't that amazing that we have violence in the U.S.? I could, I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> Sports and things like that. So of all the injuries that we're looking at there, for spinal cord injuries, only 12.7% in sports. You'd think that's higher, particularly with the impact of, of the American football and things like that. And look, look at the other here. Uh, the age of these here. I thought this thing laser worked. Doesn't show up there. But it's right up there. And then, oh, there that right there too, 81.6% male. That doesn't surprise anybody because women are smarter than we are. They know how to not to get hurt. Okay. Other causes, vascular tumors, all these kinds of things or uh, additional things, infectious conditions, 
Spondylosis, you guys are going to talk about that, spondylosis, spondylolisthesis, so I'll, I'll skip that. Iatrogenic vertebral fracture, secondary osteoporosis as we age and things like that. And remember, you don't have to be old necessarily to have osteoporosis. It can certainly occur at, at younger ages. So, and then high-risk sports, there are just tons of those. Now, remember, you're going to get a copy of this, so don't worry about it. Um, you should not move a patient to suspect a spinal cord injury unless they are in danger. I think most of you have done that. How many of you have covered events where you have to make a decision on removing an athlete? You have a rugby here, right? So how many of you have covered rugby matches? Have you ever had to remove anybody, Brad? Okay. And same thing, Michael? Yeah. So we always make sure that you are well-versed in how to uh, assess and then uh, remove those people, spine boards, things like that. So I've just included a few of these things in here for you to look at. And then I mentioned that core, but this is the idea here. In instability alone, there are six different tests for instability of the cervical spine. Myelopathy is eight, all kinds of other tests, five, radiculopathy, 19 tests. And then for treatment classification, just one. So when you look up each one of those, that will give you an idea of what they are. And if we look for instability, these are the tests that are listed under the instability here. I've just put them down there for you. If you want to look up any specific ones later, you can. And then the myelopathy, here they are here. You, some of them you're probably familiar with. Most people know Hoffman's, but how many of them might know inverted supinator, for an example? But so you can go on that or you can just Google those and you'll find out what they are. Look at radiculopathy. So there are a lot of different tests for us to differentially diagnose this radiculopathy in the cervical spine. And then the, this is just getting into the thoracic spine. That's why I'm going to do this real quickly and try to get some little hands on here for you. But sideline examination, we always check them when we go there. Are they... Uh, are they uh, awake or they are, what am I trying to tell you? Are they concussed, that kind of thing? And then the central motory part of the upper extremity, is it functioning? How do you test for that and so forth? So just these kinds of things for you to consider. Uh, and rib fractures, another thing. Uh, of course, the mechanism there, there are many of those. And you definitely want to be careful with those and make sure that you don't have a punctured lung to go with it, things like that. The rib fracture here, compression test, we've got some of those uh, for you. But they're also described on that site for you. And then uh, let's talk a little bit about the costal uh, vertebral joint. What is the innervation of the joint? Do you guys remember? What, the students, where are my students? So, do you remember? So if I gave you the lumbar, the cervical spine, or something, would you remember? Say that again. It's the middle branch of the posterior primary ramus. You're right on that, Michael. So that's it's the middle branch. Now, why is that important? Because that branch innervates the joint. It innervates the muscles that move that joint. And what else does it do? It innervates the fascia that covers the muscles that move that joint. Okay, so that's why it's got these series so known as Hilton's Law. So if you look up Hilton's Law, that's what it is. So that's why someone with pain, if it's in the cervical spine, for an example, depending on the level, you'll get localized pain, you may get spasm there, and you're going to get uh, some pain that is distal to that. It may go into spasm. And it could be, if it's more than one level, it could be several dermatomes. So you'll get that spread out. The same thing when we get to the lumbar spine. It's going to be, uh, for example, lumbar spine depends on where you are. Uh, you may have that sudden catch syndrome. Have you ever experienced that where you've had a patient tell you they just all of a sudden they moved and they couldn't get up or they couldn't ambulate or whatever? And some of you may have experienced that. Well, that's because that nerve seems to get a little caught in there. And then it's a very simple thing to do to treat it. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit to you uh, here a little bit later. But anyhow, that's Hilton's Law, so don't forget Hilton's Law and the innervation. And then, yes, we have to be cognizant of that. I, I, again, I want to go up here to the fascia just a minute. This is from Thomas Meyer's book, Strolling, uh, not Strolling, uh, Anatomy Trains. 
And that's one piece of fascia, as you can see here. So look, what muscle is that right there? Trapezius, right? Look at cervical spine up here, going all out, all the way out to the fingers. So now I want you to understand the reason for that is the connectability. If I've got someone with an elbow problem, could they also have a shoulder or wrist problem? At least one segment above or below? So if I'm treating only, if they've got the elbow, and I'm treating only the elbow, I might miss that connection through the fascial chain to make them better. So I want you to start thinking about that a little bit more, and we'll get into that a little bit later again. And then in the lumbar spine, uh, the orthopedic test, I'm not going to go through all these, but they're, they're there for you. I, again, I want to spend more time on some hands-on. But you guys are very quick. You've memorized those already, I know. Uh, this is Barker and Briggs. And this, uh, what they did is they took cadavers initially that were embalmed. Later, they repeated the same thing in unembalmed cadavers. But this is published in the Spine magazine. And they looked at the thracolumbar fascia. And if you look at the thracolumbar fascia here, you'll see that it actually begins down in the sacrum. So that fascia runs from the sacrum and its attachments here, the lumbar spine, the thoracic spine, then it connects the thorax to the upper extremity. And again, dealing in sports, if I have a right-hand thrower and they have shoulder pain, where else am I going to look? I'm gonna look at that lower back, right? I may look at the SI joints, I may look at the glutes, I may look at the, uh, anything in that lower area I'm going to look at, even into the sacrum. So this is kind of interesting. What they did is they, they put a device down here and they tugged on the fascia at the sacral level. And then they measured where that was felt, the forces, the shoulder, but not just the uh, ipsilateral side, the contralateral shoulder also. So if I have a right hand overhand thrower, I'm also going to look at the lower left SI joint lower back. It may be ipsilateral, but it may be contralateral. So you're following me? Are you kind of getting the idea of, of the role that fascia really plays in w how we function? And you saw it real time before, right? So there, uh, there's a lot of uh, research going on with it right now. And then they, uh, they have another slide here where they were showing you some of the other fascia underneath that. So this is a deeper layer of the fascia. Remember, we have the superficial, middle, and deep layer and now we have the, what, the other side with the blood and the uh, liquid portion of that. But also, you, all these underlying structures may have it too. Now, uh, Dr. Hyland and I went to Logan College, so this is the most important ligament in the body. That's the sacral tuber's ligament. So that's, that's, if you don't touch that, you're not going to get anybody better. <laughs> Kidding. But at any rate, the sacral tuberous ligament. Now, that thing serves as the transport right from the lower extremity into the thorax. So if I've got someone with a knee problem or even an ankle problem, I've done it as far away as the ankle or that kind of thing, I'm also going to look at the lower back. I'm going to look at the SI joints there and the glutes and the piriformis and all of those things. So when you look at someone now, I want you to start thinking about them as an entity to include that fascia. Okay? Don't forget it. Did anybody ever treated someone that, they, that just didn't seem to get better? Have any of you ever been treated and it just didn't quite go away like you'd like it? Well, think about why that's happening, okay? And it may be fascial, it may not. I'm, a, I'm one of those fascists, but I think that that's, <laughs> that's where a lot of it comes from. So anyhow, this is their uh, Bark and Briggs again some of their stuff. And the other thing, real quick, what does that say up there? Thracolumbar fascia? And then what is a horizontal view of the lumbar vertebra and so forth? How about from the abdomen, we have a connection to the spine right here. If you look at that right up there, that's through the supraspinous ligament. So if I have someone who's having a back problem, another thing I'm going to look at is the abdomen. Have they had C-sections? Have they had hernias? Have they had gallbladder surgery? Anything abdominal surgery? So I'm going to look at that. You know how many back problems I've cleared up by treating the scar on the abdomen and never had to treat the back? You think I'm nuts, but try it. I am nuts, but try that anyway. And I think you'll find that uh, you're going to get a lot of people better and usually quicker. So anyhow, I want you to see that connectability throughout. Davis's Law, this just... Uh, 
has to do with uh, muscles and you put them just like you would uh, stretch anything, put it under load. If uh, walking to get my osteoblast to uh, make those bones stronger, same thing with the muscles. You can increase that under Davis's law. Uh, yeah, the, the prostaglandins and the glycosaminoglycans, you heard the, the young lady talk about the, the uh, um, glycosaminoglycans. That's one of the reasons we ask people to hydrate after you treat them or after they're doing various things because it helps resupply those glycosaminoglycans. And you probably saw some of those dripping off those fibrils. I don't know if you noticed that. But if you go back and look again, you'll see that. So we need to do that after you treat someone, particularly with the instruments and things, you want to make sure they hydrate. And while we're on that topic, how many of you have heard of fascial manipulation by Stecco? Okay, so a few of you. Uh, those of you who've, who have not, Luigi Stecco is a uh, physical therapist in uh, Padua, Italy, who for probably 40 years or so has looked at the human fascia. And he and his daughter and son have published extensively. So if you want to look up Stecco or Google S-T-E-C-C-O, Luigi, and then the son is a physiatrist and also a PhD, and the daughter is an orthopedic and a PhD. So they've collaborated on it. One of the things that they found that I think is very interesting, there are a lot of things, by the way. They have some textbooks and articles, but you can Google them and read some of their uh, work and research, is that they looked at pain and stiffness, for an example, in the spine. And one of the things they found is that if you have increased hyaluronic acid in the fascial region, it's going to be stiff and it can be painful. So their technique involves a very deep kind of massage. It can be very painful, uh, but it's very effective. I prefer the instruments don't hurt as badly, but they get very deep. And they have shown, they published, that they can change the viscosity of the extracellular matrix uh, by simply, or the, the amount of hyaluronic acid in the extracellular matrix with this deep massage. And when they do that, patients get better range of motion, better movement, less pain, greater function. So something else to consider here is that hyaluronic um, concentration in the extracellular matrix. There are your fractals and so forth from before, allowing you to slide one surface over another. And you know what? Does anyone have two blank pieces of paper? Can I do a quick demonstration that I used to show patients all the time? Does anyone have any? I don't have any with me. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's assume here, if I can get this, yeah, that we have two pieces of fascia. So if I bring these here like this, and I can slide them back and forth, it's not a problem, is it? But what happens now if I undergo some sort of trauma, and trauma starts creating changes in that fashion, we get scarring or we get those kinds of things. So I'll just open this up now. And if we look at this, this is kind of representing what scar tissue might look like in the body. It's changed the shape. Now, when I try to glide this across, it just doesn't move very well. So it doesn't function. It's abnormal function. So then if I now, I've done Nemo for years. I've done a lot of pin and stretch or ART or all these kinds of things, and they're great things to learn and to do. So if I wanted to come over here and, and just do some just gliding motions, like even with my hand or these kinds of things, I can do this and kind of get that straightened out. I'm doing it very quickly for you, but you see I can do those kinds of movements with it. And a lot of times when I do flexion distraction with the Cox table, I would also do that with my hand. So I'm moving that. And by the way, does anyone have cups in here? Cupping? You didn't bring any with you, did you, and a little gun? Well, that's another thing I like to do on that Cox table because I can take that cup and then when I'm going into flexion, and now they have rotation and side bending with them, the, the new tables. So you can put that cup on there, and instead of leaving the cup there, I don't do that anymore. I put a little uh, mollient across to give it a, a gliding surface, and then leave it right. And as I'm going down with that table, I'm gliding that thing all over the place. And it's incredible because that lifts all that fascia and skin underneath that cup. Instead of just leaving it, and you don't get the hickeys. 
the big red marks on it by, by moving it. And it's unbelievable. So you can use it on any part of the body. So if I'm doing a shoulder, I'll have them moving the shoulder, and I'm also moving that cup. So try the movement of the cup, if you will, those of you who do it. And if you don't do dry needling or you don't do that, it's okay. You can still get the cups, and you can try it. I guess that's legal here for you. It's okay to do? Okay. Now, you saw what I did with my hand, but um, if I use the instrument, I'll just pull this out, and I go. And by the way, you see this paper, how everything goes in multiple directions? It's not north, south, east, west. It's not here to there. It's all over the planet. So I'll come in here, and I'll, I'm going to do the same thing with my instrument when I'm treating the fascia because I don't want to miss a part of it that needs to be, to be uh, treated. Now, when I finish that, and you see it's a little bit better, but still got this. Now, if I put it under load and stretch it, so I like to have them stretch it after that, we can maintain more of that uh, flat thing as opposed to the ridges and everything else. Does that make sense to you? I, I think I'm not sure I explained that fully, but hopefully you got the, the idea there. Any questions anybody has on any of this? Yes. I'll repeat it for you. She's asking if we're dealing with a gymnast who's very flexible. When they're coming out of that flex position, yeah. Okay, you want to repeat? So she's asking about, in other words, if they're flexed over and then they're come, they have the pain as they come out of flexion. Yeah, same thing. You can do that as well. So you just, if they bend over as they're coming out of flexion, you take your cups or your instrument, you do the same thing. Exactly. Now, is, is that a... Is that an indication of dehydration then in the fascia, or is it a lack of like the hyaluronic acid, or what is creating that? Well, that's a great because question. It should be sliding both ways, but it's only sliding one way. So it's going into stretch, no problem, but it's not contracting easily again. The underlying cause is the difficult part. Is it because there's more uh, concentration or greater concentration of hyaluronic acid? Is it because they have scarring in there? Is it because somewhere there's a nerve that's trapped? In, it could be in the fascia. It doesn't always have to be in the joint. Yeah. So there are lots of, of potential causes, and that's the hard part sometimes as the clinician is figuring out which it is. Okay. So I don't have a, a direct answer that I can give you to know what that cause may be, a single okay. cause. And it's not always consistent. It'll be, you know, one day it's fine, next training, not so great. So there has to be, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fluid changing mechanism somewhere in that. Well, that's why I'm saying if you're treating the low back where that is only, and you're not looking at the connectability of other parts of that body, you're probably going to get the same response all the time. So go up or down or sideways, medial, lateral, to wherever you're finding it and treat it actually as they're coming up with the load and the pain. And it can be in multiple areas. It can be in multiple areas, Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I would recommend. Does anybody in here have, uh, well, we're on the, it doesn't matter, spine anywhere, neck, or uh, something that they want to come up here in a few minutes and let me do a little uh, surgery? <laughs> any, any takers, anybody? Because I can do it, yeah, okay. So in just a minute, we'll call you up. Is it spine or uh, where? Low back. Pardon me? Low back. Low back. Low back. <laughs> it's, it's the uh, accent. I love your accents. <laughs> or yeah. we don't have accents, right? <laughs> so, all right. So factor and muscle things. Now, this is a, a, how many of you knew that all these structures are contained in the fascia? So your Golgi tendons your spindle cells, the Pacini corpuscles, all of these things are contained in fascia. Who knew that until a few years ago when the fascias told us? So now we know. So when I am treating your fascia, I'm also doing that, right? I'm exciting and treating these little structures as well. So when we get into, let's say, uh, the nociceptors, uh, I'm sorry, let's go to the proprioceptors for an example. So now when I'm doing this little thing like this, I'm firing my proprioceptors, aren't I? 
If I want to make it more complicated, then I can come over here and I can have them stand on the stability pad, balance on the stability pad, and shake this and move it in different patterns. So I can do my D1, D2 exercises for shoulder. You remember putting the sword in, taking the sword out? So I can do this, have them stand and treat that shoulder and fire the proprioceptors. But I'm getting what? The nervous system is also working, isn't it? So we have a conglomeration of things, of things that are going on at one time. And it's really, to me, it's kind of interesting to see the progress when you start adding some of these things to people. I use something called an iJoy board. It's a vibratory little thing. I know Chris is smiling here. It's one of our favorite toys that we have. But it looks like a skate, uh, skateboard on the top. And it's about the size of a skateboard, something like that. And then it sits on a little platform that's motorized with different speeds. And the idea is we can have people stand on that and it vibrates so it's already challenging them neurologically and they have to balance on that thing and we'll treat them on it. And I can do upper extremity as well. I can have them do a push up or a plank on their elbows. And if I want to really get it complicated, I can put their hands on it, put their feet on a ball, a physical ball, and now they're really having to balance and do things. But I've treated a lot of different conditions on that. And one of the things that we did, uh, and we, we tried to publish it. We've got, had three cases now of, uh, well, I, you know what, remind me, I'll talk about that when, when we get to the knee. Just remind me, talk about it. But uh, there's some other things that we've done with uh, the iJoy board, and it could be any kind of a vibratory kind of thing. So it works really well when you're treating them with this vibration. It's amazing what you'll see. Any questions on any of the other things so far that I've covered? Yes. Is that Dr. Till? I'm afraid so. <laughs> well, the, what the, else? The never-ending professor, and yes. yes, go ahead, sir. Going back to what you said about treating the fascial planes distant from the area of complaint of the patient, do you try to, let's assume you use a Graston instrument too, for that purpose. Do you cover the whole plane as much as possible, or do you try and identify tender areas that might be indicative of critical areas that need attention in the fascia? And how much pressure do you use? Well, that's a lot of great questions in one. <laughs> but thank you, Dr. Till. Uh, when, when I first started with Grasson Technique, we were doing one to two minutes of treatment. Well, we found that people really had petechial changes. They got sore afterwards. Uh, so we started looking at the depth of pressure, the length of time that we're treating. And what we found out is, obviously, that everyone has a different threshold of pain. So I could come over to D Dr. Hyland here, and I could push on him and just put a very light pressure, and that could still hurt him, right? I've got other people out there I can hit with a sledgehammer and they don't feel anything. Have you experienced that in your practices or things? You're gonna see that. So what, what I've done, what I did, and I don't know that's the right thing, but I now treat about 30 to 45 seconds. And then I'll stop and retest them. And then I'll do that two or three times in an area. Now, if that's beginning to show signs that it's, that's probably part of the area, then I'm gonna uh, go ahead and treat that. If I find that that's not necessarily good, I'm going to move up or down that kinetic chain. And I'll do the same thing at different spots. So I can do it very quickly. In 10 minutes, I can do an awful lot of the uh, kinetic chain. And the other thing is, this was, I, I'll have to tell you a story since you asked. I was treating the center for the University of Miami. The guy is 6'6", 295 pounds. Now, I'm not quite as big as him, just a little bit letter, less. So he had a sesamoidopathy on his hallux underneath. So how did I do it? Well, I tried to recreate the problem. So the only way he could do that is he, I had him do this. It's like when he was blocking. So when he flexed that toe, it killed him. So they put a, a metal rod in his shoe so he couldn't flex his, his uh, toe. And he'd had that for eight months, that shoe, and uh, it's still killing him. So when he came over, I had him doing that, and I'm down there. Now, I can't see him. So I'm grinding away, and I'm grinding away, and I'm not cognizant of how long I'm grinding away and how hard I'm going. I think this is a big guy. He can take it, right? I don't even think about it. Well, Susan, my wife, walks in the room, and this guy is perspiring, and he's red. 
And then I, I stop and I look up and, and uh, anyhow, he had a couple of comments. I said, why didn't you say something? So I learned a valuable lesson. What I do now is I have, instead of zero to 10, like on a VAS, that's too many numbers for people to remember. So I just go one, two, three, four, five. I say a number one is I'm barely touching you. You don't feel very much. A five is it's killing you, but I want your three, your level three, because your level three and his and yours and mine, they're all different. So when I get to your level three, that says that is a little bit uncomfortable, but I can take it. Please don't go anymore. Because if I'm down there and I can't see their face, I need a way to communicate. Like I'm always asking them, what level am I? What level am I? And I want to go to that three. And I found if I go to their level three, I'm very successful in getting rid of what I'm trying to treat. Now, that, that's a lot, isn't it, uh, to answer your question? But that guy taught me that's what I needed to do. And then, again, when, for five days he couldn't walk. So trying to explain to the trainers and the medical staff what I had done and to please give me another chance plus him, that was hard. But that taught me a lesson. So after that, it took me five more treatments to get rid of that. So that took me six treatments total, but that, they got rid of that thing, and he didn't have another issue for the two more years he was there. And then when he had cervical problems, he came to see me, and he had a shoulder problem, he came to see me. That took one treatment each because I learned the hard way. Okay, did I answer your question now? Did you have a follow-up, or is that it? Did, does all that make sense to y'all? Uh, to, to you, uh, you all? Excuse me. Sorry. All, all of y'all. <laughs> That's that southern thing. I'm sorry. It's uh, south. The thracolumbar fascia, we've been over that a lot, so you kind of get that. So this is, these are just some of the ways I'll show you real quickly how we may treat them. You see how he's arching the back and then going back into a hollowed position? So we may do that, uh, just lots of different ways to treat the back, standing, prone, supine, kneeling. It doesn't matter, it's, uh, and here's adding rotation. It depends on what recreates their pain, discomfort. Remember, it's loss of function, loss of range of motion, pain, or tightness. Those are the criteria, so it's not always pain-based. And then getting here over the ball, I told you about treating the abdomen and with backs. I like to do it anyway. And it only takes, you can do that uh, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and then just check them and see how they are. So it's real quick. It's really simple to do. Um, and then sometimes I've even gone up underneath the diaphragm. So you can do that. But just lying them over a ball like this, the other thing, what are they doing there? They have to balance, don't they? So they're firing proprioceptors, the neurological system's back into play again. So we're adding multiple com components here. Come on. Uh, there we go. This is, we do different things like, for an example, and I'm sorry to be redundant for those of you who've taken the class, but it, it doesn't matter whether you do factor or something else. And by the way, factor is a concept. Boy, those lights are bright. Factor is a concept, it's not a technique. It can be used with any technique you're already using. So it's, it's easy to incorporate. Those of you who've taken it, have you noticed that so far? Yes or no? Okay. It's hard, it's hard to see with those lights. Uh, but at any rate, we ask, is the pain in, in the static position? Let's take the show. Uh, we're on the spine. Does it hurt me in my cervical spine or thoracic or lumbar spine by standing? If it does, we're going to start treating you in the standing position. If that doesn't hurt, then what happens if you move that? So if I have you rotate or I have you flex or I have you extend or something like that, does that bring on the pain or discomfort or you just can't do it? So that would be the step two. If that doesn't do it, the next thing we're going to do, well, what happens if I load you? So I have you bend or flex or twist with some kind of a weight or a band to give you a resistance. And if that does it, then we're going to treat it that way. From that, the next thing is a function. So what would be a function? Bending over to pick up my briefcase or reaching over to do something else, getting under a sink to do plumbing or whatever it may be. So that's a function. We actually have you recreate that function. So you can do it without the plumbing and the, all that stuff. You can have them recreate the same thing just in an environment in the office. And then the last one is um, proprioception. So we'll add proprioception uh, we may add it with one, two, or three, or four of the above, load, no load, etc. Does that make sense to all of you? 
it's not that complicated, really. It's a very simple thing, but it's very quick and easy to do. And then this is just showing weights. The other one back there, by the way, that's starting a lawnmower. So just that, how many of you ever seen someone do that and have a back problem or back issue? Do you guys still have pull things here? Okay. So that, and then just a regular weight here. And then that's the iJoy board. That's the iJoy board right there. That thing is great. But here, just now, having him stand on the iJoy board, stand on the uh, band, and then do a function there while he's also undergoing tremendous amount of vibration. And then just different ways here, again, of treating someone here. For example, if I'm going to do a deadlift or I'm going to do a, a clean and jerk or something like that, or a lift, and using the bands and treating. So we're trying to use anything that we have available for us. Uh, you've got things in your office that you can use. Uh, that's Todd that taught you guys the class, I think. So this is uh, part of his things, or these are part of his. And then on the cervical spine, just real quickly, and then we're going to bring you down. Cervical spine, just getting in and treating. Don't forget the skull has fascia. So when I'm treating that, particularly for occipital headaches, that kind of thing, I'm going to go over that fascia. I'll go all the way over. When I do TMJ, I hit, at least hit the temporalis, if not the frontal and, and others. But I'll hit all of that and not just the TMJ joint. I'll go down into the scalenes and the SCMs. So um, you might think about that as well when you're doing these other parts to address them. And then just getting in specifically and then mo moving the head in different uh, directions. And I've done that for headaches, too. I mean, it's unbelievable how it gets rid of that occipital headache. And then this is going into the facet joint. Bless you. I'll use my fingers sometimes, but I'll also use an instrument. But with my finger, I can get right into that joint, move the head back into a 45-degree angle, go into that joint, and I'll move my finger in there, my thumb usually, in there. And it's amazing how you can help get rid of that uh, joint pain or in that facet joint by just simply doing that. And then this is a function, driving a car, starting to look back in a mirror, that kind of thing, using the bands and then getting into the SCMs. So you can just have them move their head. Uh, I can pull the band from the, from the rear. They can do it from the front. I can do the rotators too. I think we have one of that. It pulls one side, then the other, but he has to stabilize when we're treating the SCMs from the anterior or the posterior neck muscles at the same time. Sitting on a ball and doing something else. So again, the proprioceptors and so forth. Is this boring for you? Oh, okay. So this is driving the car. That's the one where he's got the steering wheel there. We've got a stability pad for a steering wheel. So you've got to be creative. And then just looking the other way, pulling up, shrugging at the same time, rotating the head. So for those with stiff necks, things like that, we do a lot of this where they're going to load it, they're going to turn, etc., and we do a number of things. Peter Garbutt helped with a couple of those slides, so I want to give him a little credit. And then that's my email. If you need me, you can get a hold of me. Now, if you don't mind, uh, you want to come on down? Is there anything particular you all wanted to see on, on her? Yes, you had a question. Good morning. Good morning. Um, just two questions. Um, when, when you are, are treating with movement, are you getting them to move slower than they would normally, or is it a normal movement? That's a great question. So if I have someone who is throwing a ball very quickly, that's very difficult to treat them. So then we slow the motion down. And what I may do there is load them with the bands so they can't go too hard. I give them enough resistance with a band so they're going through the same motion to bring it on. So we try to find another way. And if, it's, if they're kicking, the same thing. I can attach that to their ankle or their knee or something else and then slow that motion down. OK, thank you. And then you spoke about using sort of your pain level and time as a guideline on an area. Um, do you factor in sort of the petechiae bruising thing? Because some people might bruise a lot faster than others as well. And you don't want to sort of go through that too hard. Yes, and thank you for bringing that up. Uh, when we get the um, patechial changes, we know what that is. That's rupture of these little cells in there, and that releases histamine. 
So that's where that redness comes from. It's that release of histamine. So we try to explain that to the patients. You may get that. That's what it is. And they arnica-based compounds do a really good job of getting rid of that fairly quickly. They could take tablets or you can do ointments, that kind of thing. And then uh, my daughter actually studied herbs and things for several years, and she's doing another two-year course right now. And she makes all kinds of tinctures and things like that. She's made something she calls Boo Boo Balm. And it has, I know, I love the name, right? But uh, I've used that for um, petechial changes and for uh, cuts, mosquito bites, things like that. It works really well. And it helps get rid of that very quickly. So you might try some of those. There are other products. There are lots of products on the market that may change that. Did that answer your question? No? No, you seem like you still have something else. No, no, I'm fine. Okay. And you know the other thing about icing, we used to tell them to ice it, but now, have you guys read the literature where they tell you about icing? That don't put ice right on your acute injury right away. It actually can retard the healing process. So don't do it right then. Wait, wait a couple of years and then do it. <laughs> I don't know how long it takes. Okay, come on. Any other questions while we're waiting? Okay. What's your name? Marie. Marie. So Marie, do you have uh, an issue? There's a question. Dr. Hyde, there's a question. Oh, excuse me. We're going to come back to Marie in one second. I can't see. Where's the question? Oh, yeah. yes. Um, what about how chronic the issue has been? Do you alter your treatment according to how chronic um, the patient has had the problem? Like if they've started maybe developing signs and symptoms of arthritis, do you now alter your, the way you treat them? Okay, in other words, if I have an acute injury versus a chronic, or is that kind of what you're asking me? Yeah, if I like to get the acute injury as quickly as I can possibly get, get, it, get to it, if it's dealing with a, a, a chronic issue, then I just start assuming that it is chronic, but if I can get it, the sooner I can get it, the better I think the results are. The faster they're back to normal, working, playing, whatever they're doing. Does it get, um, do you do it for longer sessions? Then? No, okay. no, it's still the same time, 30 to 45 seconds. And, and then I'll rest them, recheck them. Uh, so if I've got someone that's a, a kicker and they're kicking the ball, you, you have, do you have the Aussies football here? Or, but rugby, right? Okay, rugby, tough sport. So anyhow, if it's a lower extremity, for an example, or the spine, since we're on the spine, then I'm gonna to try to find out what's reproducing that. Is it flexion, is it extension, is it rotation, is it combinations of those? And then go ahead and treat it, whether it's chronic or it's acute. And I'll do the same time frame on it. And then, you know, roughly about three, and then I'm gonna look somewhere else up or down that kinetic chain. I may go to that initial spot, but then I'm gonna go elsewhere in it. Did, did I answer you? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes, another one? Um, oh, we'll come in. I know with the stego technique, I think we were treating and then resting for seven days before we were allowed to affect the, the fascia system the second time. With factor, what is your time to leave it before you retreat it? That's a great question. The, the most I've ever treated anybody is four times in, in one day. So I don't wait that seven days, but I may go, uh, if they're a little sore, I'll back off from the pressure, or I'll go to another point that I think may be affecting that that maybe I didn't treat earlier. So you don't feel that there's a fascial changing phase that takes place from your treatment that you should wait for the fascia to unravel to a point that you readdress it? Now, I'm not a uh, researcher. I'm just a simple little clinician. So With lots of experience. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Well, when you're 150, you, you get a little experience. But uh, I've, I've not done that. I've gone right back. I've even gone over, but I'll back off on the pressure. So in other words, if I'm going to their level three, I might only go to a one or two, just a real soft thing. Remember, we have something called a brush stroke too. So if someone is painful and I can't really get in there very much, then I do that real rapid back and forth, very light pressure. And that desensitizes them. Now I can pick up the pressure to their level three. Okay. So if I'm doing a second or third time on that patient the same day, then that's what I'll do. I may have to go in there and do that brush stroke first to desensitize it. Then I can go ahead. Okay. 
Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Well, oh, Marie, we're gonna we're gonna get to you. Yes. Um, I just want to know how would you test for fascial stiffness? So you mentioned earlier that if you have a problem, you might go a little bit up or down depending if it might affect the area. But how would you really test and know does it affect the area or doesn't? Well, that's a that's another. Gosh, you guys have great questions. You don't know. But I do know enough to know that if I'm doing a, uh, let's take a shoulder for an example, and I'm treating the shoulder where their symptoms are, and I'm not getting it, I know that it's time to look elsewhere. And I may look at two or three other areas that are not connected, but I don't give up. I keep looking at that chain somewhere, because somewhere in that, there's going to be a connection between that shoulder pain and the part I'm treating. So sometimes I'll treat and nothing, no change. And I'll go to another area and treat, no change. And I'll go to another one. It may be that third or fourth or fifth time in that kinetic chain before I find the key to what the, what's causing that shoulder problem or issue. Does that make sense? Okay. But, you, I mean, you've got to be a detective. And it's not always easy. It's, and have I failed? That's the one that, that's why I don't have any hair. All those ones that I've failed, I mean, they drive me nuts. Is anybody else that way where you don't sleep? If you've missed something on a patient, you just... I mean, I do. I wake up and I'm thinking, why didn't I try this or why didn't I try that? Or, gosh, I'm, I'm at my wit's end. I'll call somebody else. What would you try? If you don't think I don't call other people, all the time. So, yeah, I don't have all the answers, I guarantee you. But I have fun with what I do. Who else had a question? Yes. Oh, Dr. Till again. What criteria do you use to decide on any one particular patient that you're going to treat them, say, once a day, two, three, four times a day, once every other day? That's, uh, again, thank you for asking that question. The older population, I tend to treat less frequently. But with athletes, and those, because uh, a lot of times, remember, I covered American football in real time, so they were injured, and I had to treat them and try to get them back in the game, if their condition was such that they could be treated and put back in the game. So those are the ones that I would typically treat three, four times in a day. Um, we covered the Central American Caribbean games, a lot of different games and things like that. So that's what we tend to do. But someone else that maybe is a little bit older, uh, they're having a little bit more discomfort, that kind of thing, I might wait and treat them a day or two later. I've done that as well. Give them time to relax a little bit. Or try that brush stroke to see if I can get rid of that discomfort and then try a different area. Yeah, it's, there's not all, I wish, I wish there were a simple one, two, three pattern to a lot of these things, but I don't know that there is. And because I do it this way, doesn't mean that if you do it differently than I do, that it's wrong. I, I wouldn't, wouldn't even begin to say that. This is just through a lot of time and a lot of experience with trying these things, and I've made mistakes. And I'll talk to you about a couple of those, but I've, I've definitely made mistakes where you just didn't get it. But the good thing is when you do get somebody that's had a, a major issue and they couldn't get it elsewhere that this works with, it's been pretty good. Anybody else? Okay, Marie, shall we? So, uh, what's your, uh, do you want to tell them? Persistent right SI. Right SI persistent. Okay, uh, what activities aggravate it? Constantly active. So running Even make it worse. Running, sitting, sitting. constantly standing, sitting here now. Just okay, so sitting would do it. So let's do this. Y'all don't mind, do you? I'll just have her sit this face this way, and it's right SI joint, right? All right, now I assume you've, uh, somebody's examined you and treated you and this kind of thing. Manipulation has or has not helped? It does help. Well, it well you know what? Just stand up for a minute. It's the right SI joint? Yeah. Okay, just flex forward for me a little bit. Let's just see what you've got. Nice shoes. Okay, come on up. <laughs> lean back. You think that might play anything to it? Should we throw those out? Okay, lean back. Any pain or discomfort with that? Midline. It's midline. Okay, so it's not on the SI okay. joint. Okay, so come back over this way. Do a Kemp's and back. Yeah, that's good. Okay, you feel that? It's localized though, right? It's in the SI joint. Okay. And try the other side. And that right. still bothers this side. 
So it didn't matter, did it, when the Kemp's either right or left still aggravated this right SI joint. So what would you do? Manipulator. <laughs> uh, she doesn't look like the manipulative type. So I'm, so I'm going to try a little of this. Now you notice, uh, being a lady, I'm going to go through her clothing. We were taught that you have to have hands on skin, you have to have instrument on skin, but I found it does not matter. I've done this through blue jeans, I've done this through jackets, I've, I've done it through all the things. So if you prefer hands on uh, skin or instrument on skin, it's not wrong. Help yourself. But let me do it this way. Is that okay? All right, so you want to stand up for me? Now remember, and even standing, you had a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So what I can do here, and I'll just go right over this. Now she's got uh, these trousers on. We can pull them up just a little bit. I just don't want to go to the band. So let's just palpate a little bit back here. You tell me. In tender. tender? Mm -hmm. Anything down in here? That's quite tender. That's what? That was quite tender. More medial than lateral. Oh, more medial. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in through here. Yeah. Now remember also, the sacrum has these little, um, what, do you, what do you call them, the, the foramen, where the nerves come out of there, don't they? Mm -hmm. How many of you treated the fascia over a sacrum and treated those little holes, little foramen? How many of you have done that? Yeah. So that's something to consider because you know what? That also can be a source of pain. So in this case, I'm just going to come in here very gently, and you tell me you're level three. Level three means I can tolerate that. Please don't go anymore. I don't see your face. So I'm just going to come in here and do this a little bit. Am I kind of over the area? So I'm just going to kind of give you a little quick treatment here. Very quickly. Somebody should be timing me, right, so I don't go overboard. All right, I'm just going to relax that. What was that, 20, 30? 30 seconds maybe, it wasn't too long. Just try again sure. to aggravate it. Can you say that to them, please? It's focused on left now, pain in the right better. I need an interpreter, what did she say? <laughs> pain on right better. Pain primarily, on right better. Primarily on left now. Primarily on left, yeah. so it went from here to there, right? So, okay, so let's get in a position of provocation for me, please. Right there. Okay, so we're going to come right in here real quickly. Now I want you to come to neutral and then go back into that position. So now I'm going to add a little motion to this. I want her to do that in a couple more times for me. Come up a little bit, come down a little bit, different stroke. Okay. Now, try it again. Do you feel any differently? It is a bit easier. A little bit easier. All right, now I only did that real quickly, but I'm going to try something here with her. If I can have you on your hands and knees on the table for me, please. Let me get all this out of your way. Isn't it great to be coordinated? Ah. Okay, thank you. So I'm just going to put her on her hands and knees. And I'm going to have her just do a, uh, like a cat stretch where you come up and then back down and just go down as far as you can. We're going to do the same thing on both sides. If you'd come on up and down, nice and slow and easy. Go ahead for me. Okay. Now one more time down. Now stay right there. We're going to come down here in the sacrum. I'm going to go ahead and come over the sacrum just a little bit here. And here is one of those little divot points. See, I'll just do a little bit of a squiggle like in there. Are you okay? Yeah. And I'll come on down and I'll let the, the, uh, my finger and the instrument kind of go into another one here. Just going to do a little bit real quickly. This is just a swivel stroke, a little different stroke. Come over to the other side here for a second. Can you feel those? Yeah. Is that too much for you? No. Okay, now stand up for me. And let's try it again. Movement's a lot easier. A lot easier. Okay. 
Now, I want to do one more thing for you. I want you to come over here and just come like this and then bring this leg up to your chest and then try to bring it back up that way for me. Nice and slow and easy, but bend your knee. We want to try to put your foot on the ceiling. Now try that again up to your chest and back. Now I'm going to go ahead down over the glutes a little bit here and over where I think the piriformis. When I tell you I'm on a structure, don't believe me. I'm somewhere nearby. <laughs> the best I can do. But you see what I'm doing? I'm adding a little motion now and doing different things. And now let's do the opposite side. Now the thing is, we need to know what she like in an hour, a day, right? We need to find out. So later on today, Marie, make sure you tell me how you're feeling, okay? And let us know. And this may require a couple of treatments, so we'll see. But you guys can do it from here on. You know how to do it now. Okay. Now try again your extension and see. Did I make it worse, much maybe? Easier. Oh, much easier. Okay. All right. Do you mind if I show you a little bit of getting into the facet joint in her cervical spine while she's here? Is that okay? Okay. Do you mind? No, not at all. Do you have something to pull your hair up? or? Huh? I don't have an elastic, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be great to have hair like that? Any, any hair would be, I'd love to try it. I mean, what does it feel like, seriously? Or when the wind blows, you know? Um, could, could we use this technique on runners who, who say are running a marathon in a day or two? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, well, I'm glad you asked that. There's a gentleman out in uh, San Francisco who does a lot of marathoners, and what he'll do, he'll actually do a real quick body, total body thing, in just a couple of minutes where he goes over, like the legs, he'll go over the abdomen, the back, the, uh, that kind of thing, the glutes, so forth. And then when they're back in, he's going to go back over all that again, and he finds, to me, I mean, this is anecdotal, we don't have any any studies on it, but he says that uh, once he does that and he treats them afterwards, they have a much better recovery, much faster recovery. So that's anecdotal now. I can't tell you any studies we don't have. Okay, good questions though. And you know, that's the other thing. I, I, I want you to question what I'm telling you. Don't believe me. Just try some of these things and see what happens on your own. Uh, some of the things are, are, are much, of, ooh, boy, that's ugly. So. You, it's tough to discover yourself, <laughs> you know. So uh, anyhow, uh, where was I? <laughs> don't be afraid to try something. If you're not going to hurt them, don't be afraid of it. Give it a go. It actually might work. And just think through the process. So she's having this there. What else could I do possibly to, to make her better and put her through it? So in this case, let's say that she does have a little, I don't know if you have any cervical pain or not. Not really. Not really. Mm -hmm. So let's just, I'll palpate real quickly. Let's see. Isn't bad, is it? Mm -mm. All right, so if, I'm just going to pick a point. Let's say that she's having a problem or an issue up here. So I'm going to take my finger here and I'm going to put it right in to the joint, tilt her back at about 45 degrees, stabilize her here. And then I'm just going to get in there with my finger. It might be tender anyway, is it? Not really. Not too bad. So I'll just go back and forth with that finger over what I feel is that joint. And it only takes, again, a few seconds to do that. Could I use the instrument? Yes, I can. So I can bring her back, put the instruments in there, and do the same kind of thing. Would you like better finger or instrument? Finger. She liked the finger better. <laughs> so... <laughs> Naughty, naughty. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, Marie. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so I, I've got a few more minutes. I'd really like to do something else. Does anybody else have an issue with spine at all that I could? Do a couple of things too. No one? 
Oh, come on up. Isn't it better when you do the demonstration, you can actually see it? Is that okay? Thank you, Marie, very much. <laughs> Marius. Yes. So what's uh, happened? Oh, he's got on. Oh. Oh. So explain to us what's going on, please. Slow back push. Just low back pain. Low back pain. How long has it been there? Uh, yes. It's getting yes. worse and worse. What's, what's been the diagnosis? Uh, <laughs> um, L5S1 disc degeneration with a retrolysis on L5S1 in multi-level facet joint arthropathy. That's it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do and it. on L1. Oh, syndesmophytes. You know what those are. You going to show some later today? I'm going to try to cut them off. Do you have SI problems? L5 is one. Okay, they're oh, probably oh. not syndesmophytes. They're probably asking. Well, L5 is one, L1, L2, and L2, L3. And T12. <laughs> Any others? Post, po post Scherman's disease. Oh, Scherman's. Oh, oh Scherman. yeah. yeah. Okay. Love interesting. Us. So, that's interesting, isn't it? So, you're still young, though. Yes. Yes. All right. So, what activities bother? Um, working. So, any. So, like in, in the office. office? Yeah. yeah. How about flexion? What do you have with flexion? Yeah, flexion pain across the lower back and also up. Across. On the, the, on the left side on okay. the thoracic. So, thoracic so let's see. Let, let's see how much flexion you have. Keep the knees straight. <laughs> All right. You, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do it scientifically. I need somebody with a pen who will come up here and just have him bend over, and then you're going to mark where his fingertips go, and let's see if we increase his flexibility at all. Can we do that? Anyone have a, a pen that you can come over? You don't mind no, being no, marked no. up, Mark, Mar, Marius? Mar, Mar, uh, Marius, Marius. Let's mark up Marius. Thank you, Michael. So just pull up your jeans if you don't mind, and then when he, uh, and let's do this, let's do, let's do it bare. Wow. Well, this is a rowdy crowd today, aren't you? <laughs> Did too much Johnny Walker last night, right? It's good stuff. All right, so take your shoes off if you don't mind. We're going to do this barefoot. <laughs> well, at least this has not been a boring class for me. You guys are great. It's really nice. Oh, no, <laughs> no, you can leave your pants on. Okay. <laughs> So uh, flex over, and then what you're going to do, and then bring your, bring your hands there as far as you can go. And then now mark this, and let's just see if there are any changes. So I'm going to go ahead and treat his low back. Uh, and what I need him to do after uh, Dr. Pritchard does that, could you lie on your stomach face down, please? Your head goes here. <laughs> just making sure. So I'm going to go ahead and start with his low back. I'm going to treat his low back, and then we're going to check him to see if it made a difference. I'm going to actually use a little emollient on him, if you don't mind. This is called factor emollient. It doesn't matter what you use. You can use bubble gum, chewing gum. It doesn't matter. So we're going to start with the, the, the left SI joint, low back. <laughs> I may have to have somebody sit on him if he keeps, it, keeps going. All right, so, all right, just sometimes you have to desensitize these joints because they get, they're very ticklish, and we're just going to, he'll, he'll ease up in about a month or two maybe. Now, see, he's beginning to relax already. So we had, we had and, uh, until, I, until I start, over the distal portion of that SI joint. It's a little different down here. Starting to do better? All right. Now, you got that? I want you to time me. I want you to give me about 30 seconds. Who's got a watch? Anybody? Got it? Okay, go. <laughs> he likes that, you notice? 
<laughs> or do a gin drastic maneuver of some kind. Pull your teeth out. Oh. How many seconds do I have? Stop. Okay. So now let's go. To, let's hit the other SI joint while we're down here. We're going to go through the same thing, right? <laughs> Looks like he's been in the bush barefoot here lately. <laughs> Sorry. I'm telling you. <laughs> what am I trying to do here? I'm trying. I, actually, I was, I was thinking about his bush feet. Uh, I've got to, I've got to do the, 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 the rapid thing here real quickly to try to get him to desensitize. That's what I was trying to do. It's a rapid, soft, quick movement. Now we're going to try. <laughs> try this. Yes, indeed. Breakfast. Okay, you have to bear with me. No sleep for the last couple of days. Has anybody taken that flight to America from here? It's a long way, isn't it? How about from here down to Australia and New Zealand too? Long way. All right, we're just going to do this quickly. I don't, I don't want to overdo it. About 30 seconds up? Okay. Come on up now for me, Marius, and let's uh, remeasure if you don't mind, Michael. Oops. Did that hurt getting up? Yeah. My feet are slippery. Oh, oh the feet, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is really good, isn't it? Oh. Oh. Okay, come on up. So this is a failed attempt. So uh, obviously it wasn't his SI joint, so now I'm going to try his foot. You want, you want to lie down again for me? <laughs> oh my gosh. Now remember what we did to her. I had her standing. I'm going to do you a little differently. I want you to come over to the side of the table here and then drop your leg off. And just, you're going to bring your knee up towards your chest, and then you're going to bring it up to try to touch the, your SI joint on the ceiling. Come on. I'm going to go right in here. Now, you've had problems across both, right? Yeah. All right, so let's just give me a second to put a little of this stuff on. Oh, uh, okay. Now, slowly bring it up towards your chest and then back up on the ceiling. That's it. Keep going higher. And then back down again. Just give me two or three of those. You okay here with this? Yeah. Normally we have them where I can get to the structures easier, but it's here. Okay, then back down. And then go again all the way up to the chest and back. One last time. All right, now stand up for me. And let's try any kind of motion that would provocate it. <laughs> and we can, I don't know if that's going to, we can. That's still biting, yeah. Still biting a bit? Okay. Does it feel any different? <laughs> Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> All right, but see, now we got what? A half or three quarters of an inch. But that was just treating here. Now, he said that this hurt him standing. So we're going to have him stand, get in the position of provocation for me, and point to where it is. Okay, right, he's pointing right across. Here, you want to turn around and face them? So he's pointing. Let me come over to this side. Right down. Show me again. The belt is very tight. Take a, take a belt off. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm telling you. 
Oh, boy. Okay. Now go ahead and go back into extension for me. And then flex a little bit for me. Now rotate to the, to the, that's it. Come back in that position. No, keep the position. Come back. We extend it. And go forward again for me. Am I over the area? Yes, no? Okay. Well, I'm not over your level three. Okay. All right. That's the idea. So we want it to actually be a little provocating. All right, relax it. Feels easier now. You try as far back as you can go. It's still biting, but the intensity is. Is the intensity? Off. Intensity is left. All right, just do me a favor. Just take a few walk uh, steps across. All right, try it again. <laughs> That's easier. Easier. All right, we're going to do one more quick thing. Well, we, before we do that, let's do one more thing. I want you uh, face up for me, please. Face on my back. Yes, please. Yeah, you can, you can bend your knees if you like. It doesn't matter. He's probably going to like this one, too. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> I haven't had this done in a while. <laughs> well, it's okay. I've done a lot of beer bellies. This one's in it. One more. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Isn't this fun? You get a shave at the same time. Okay, now just uh, slide your feet down for me. Nice and easy, and then come back up. Normally I'd have the socks on where you can slide down gently. And do that a couple more times for me. And we're going to relax it for a second. Now, uh, I want you to do, yeah, just bring your knees up a little bit. I want you to do just a crunch and hold it. Come up in a crunch. Hold that. Good job. Back down. Now, come up and come towards me with your crunch. Back down. Now, the opposite direction. <laughs> My wife is laughing the most. Oh, back down. Well, we're going to get him in shape here. It, you know, I can, I can get rid of this in three minutes versus him doing six months of exercise outside. No, just, just kidding. What? He gets a six-pack on mine. Okay, come on up. Now, let me show you how. If you've got a really... You, no, 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 stay that way. If you've got a really an acute back pain patient and they can't get up, set them across their arms, come in here like that, and just grab them and bring them up that way. And it's a very quick way to get them up. Okay, come on over. Let's try again. All right. <laughs> but he's, he's, I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's all right. Not too bad. We've got a little bit more on this side, just a hair. So we're a good inch or so. Now that's just in how many, how many minutes total did I have of treatment? And the next thing is, uh, in order for him to keep that, some, it's really weird. I've done people that have kept it, and you never had to do it again. I've had others, it comes right back. So you never know if it's going to stay or not. So I don't know how to predict with him. It may stay, it may not. I don't know. But go back into different positions now and just see. Definitely less. Definitely less. Okay, so you're moving a lot better. Moving Even, better with you know, decreased intensity of pain. Okay, but you still have some discomfort. Yeah. Yeah. Is it as low or is it up higher? Right, same spot. 
right there. Okay, just hang on right there one second. And, that, and that's the position of provocation, correct? Yeah, right. Okay, I want to bring this right in here. Okay, that's what I want. Right there? Yeah. There? Yeah. Okay, and that's the idea. Now go into neutral and then come back into that position several times. Still over it? Seems to be right over the top of that sacrum. Okay, and one more time. Is that it there? Okay. Now, if, if I'm doing this office, it's quick. You know, we're on the field or whatever. It's very quick. And here we're demonstrating we're doing a number of different things. Try it again now for me. Okay, so where's your wife? Right. Would you adjust before or after doing this? The yes, the question is would I adjust before or after? That's a very, very good question. I personally like doing it afterwards because I think it's a much easier thing to do afterwards. Uh, but you've got uh, Greg Dorr, who was the co developer with me, who likes to do it first. So I don't think there's an incorrect way, but for me, I find that they seem to move a lot easier when I'm in there and I've relaxed the muscles and kind of worked around that joint and so forth. It's much easier. Dry needling, there's a comparative study. To what you're doing now, the oh, there is. Oh, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Now, see if I had the cups on him right now, I would try the cups as well. I'd have him moving and doing some of the things I just did, but with the cups. So I love doing the cups and trying that because I can also pull up that fascia underneath there. And then when I move it around, that fascia is moving real time with me when I'm doing it. This way I'm compressing it more, right? So I'm still firing things. Now let's just do, you know, there's another thing that I can do with him. I can have him stand on the uh, stability pad here uh, on the involved side on a single leg. Uh, no, the, put your foot the long way. Yeah. And then come back into a, a position now because he's going to have to balance. And then when he's doing this, I'll have him come back and forth. Now, you're not allowed to cheat. Okay, then back. That's it. So this is something else that he really seriously needs to do is practice with his proprioception. One more time. Okay, now. All right, so try going back into position now. That's the same. Same, about the same. So we need to uh, probably go up or down that chain a little bit. You had a question? Uh, Dr. Hyde, is this the Couple of questions on, on the webcast. Can we can we ask? Are sure, you, sure. Uh, you the first question is. Uh, um, sorry, sorry. Do you have to use an instrument for this for the techniques you're using? Do, can you not use your hands? Yes, you can use your hands, or I can use uh, other things. And by the way, I've done a lot of spooning when I didn't have one of these, so. <laughs> A good, you know what's great is the uh, Chinese uh, soup spoons that are ceramic. They have a really smooth edge. They work extremely well. Or I'll use a stainless steel spoon. I don't like the tin spoons. They tend to have sharp edges on them. But you can use anything like that. You can certainly use your fingers. Or I have a, uh, a Nemo T-bar that I have with me. So I can use that Nemo T-bar and I can use that to go in there. There are lots of different things you could do. Uh, next question is, what is the usual age limit of patients, youngest and oldest, that you would use this technique on, or do you judge the treatment on the activity level of the patient? Yeah, another great, good question. Uh, the youngest I've personally used it on is a 12-year-old, but no side effects. This is one that had a, a problem, a tennis player with a little apophysitis on the elbow. So I just did that and literally within two or three minutes that was it, one treatment only. 
And uh, he'd had other treatments prior to that, so it was very quick. The oldest I've used it on, I think, is 95 or 96, but I just back off on the pressure. It's not, not nearly as deep as I would go on someone else. Um, the qu next question is, could facial dysfunction contribute to radicular pain? Well, I don't see why not. Do you guys know? These are a couple of experts here. What do you think? Does anybody else have a view on that? I don't see why not. I mean, it depends on the location, right? Because it has a nerve supply, first of all. And then when you think about the, the structures that it surrounds, it covers every single cell in your body. Fascist covers every single cell. It's the only thing that does that. So I would say, yeah. The, there's a next, just the last question here. Um, I think they're asking about contraindications. They are saying uh, these areas uh, to be avoided or conditions in which this technique should not be used? Yeah, I, I definitely don't use it on some of your seronegative arthritides, particularly in the inflammatory phase. Things like that we'd stay away from. Uh, if uh, history of um, other disorders that might be contraindicated, maybe Marfan's, I might not use it on somebody with Marfan's, or there are probably others off the top of my head. I can't remember that question. What else did you have, Peggy? Maybe diabetes, pretty advanced. Yeah, yeah, advanced. Neuropathies. Yeah, things like that. Now, I have used it on some neuropathies. Uh, pregnancy, I definitely stay away from the abdomen, lower back on pregnancies. I stay, if I'm going to do acupuncture, stay away from spleen six. Some of the other points I'd stay away from. LI4, I wouldn't do. These are just points that, spleen six particularly, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay away from any of those points. And I think uh, you'll probably be okay. But if they've got an ankle problem, again, I'm going to avoid spleen six down there. But I'd probably treat that or shoulder problem. So are you going to avoid what? Six? I avoid here, here, uh. and the other points. Uh, and another question, yes. Chronic numbness. Chronic numbness from what? Uh, nerve innovation, that's not correct. Well, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I've had a chronic numbness, and I don't know that I've ever had, I don't think I've ever had that question. I don't know the cause of that. Do you have a cause for it? Well, usually nerve damage. I'm sorry? Does it help with, with nerve damage that's affecting that? Uh, uh, well, that? Uh, the only thing I could say is maybe I've not really done it, so I don't, I don't have a direct answer for you. I'm sorry. You've never had people with numbness, N with dead well, fingers, hands? Legs, well, let's put it this way. I had a very serious injury on my own hand, and I, I did have numbness and tingling, and uh, I've done a lot of treatment to my, to my hand, and I will say that it has changed now that you're talking about it, but I don't know that I've really treated someone else like with a, a neuropathy type of thing, where they're getting the numbness, and you... you know, now, if the nerve to it is, is damaged in some way, I don't know how I would really be able to return that. I don't know. Four minutes. Four hours. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I don't know. But let me ask some of the others, and if I can find an answer, I'll get back to you. I can just let Michael know, but I'll ask. Let me ask uh, my guru, Warren Hammer. You guys know Warren? Let me ask Warren. Warren would have an answer for me, and I'll get back to you. Remind me to do that, and I'll do it. So I've, I've only got a couple more minutes. Would you like to see another quick demonstration of something? Okay. Uh, can you let somebody follow up with you now? And, and uh, I didn't go on up into his lumbar spine or really a lot down into the glutes, but if you guys would try a few more things and see what you can do with him. And you, by the way, have you had any shoulder issues too or anything up top? Okay. All right, so if y'all don't mind, if you'd follow up with him and then just let us know. Uh, what else would you like to see? Has anybody else got something? We've got three and a half minutes. I can do a quick demonstration on anything you'd like. Yes, come on down. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw his hand first. And normally we sterilize these between. Okay, we got someone. I don't have uh, the exact equipment. Sorry. We're all chiropractors. Yes. We're all in the same family, right? Yes, sir. Hi. Nick. Nick. Yes, Nick. Um, I've got a tennis elbow and a bit of shoulder pain. Oh, tennis elbow and shoulder. Well, we're going to do something on that later, but since he's here, you don't mind, do you? So we're going to, uh, where's that little thing? I think we've got time to do this. Are you familiar with the Tyler twist? Uh, yeah, I always get it. 
Uh, yeah, but, but this is what I want, right? Which one is it? It's this side. This side, okay. So you're gonna put it here, 90 degrees, external rotation. Take the other hand, turn it upside down, twist, bring it straight out. Now do not, don't, don't start yet, just hold it right there. And then you're gonna let it go down slowly, right? You know that. So. Okay, let's go back again. No, no, start over. Start over. Let me just spread this. So he wants to extend it as much. Extend the other wrist when you bring it up. Extend it. That's it. So it gives you a lot more when you come up. Now twist it. Come out. And keep this all the way up as far as you can. Now slowly unwind. No, no, no. Hang on. Here. We're going to get it. Here. Here. Bring it up slowly, slowly unwind it all the way down. Just let it uncurl all the way down very, very slowly. You're doing great. Thank you. You bet. <laughs> now go ahead. Nope. This one stays. This one unwinds. That's it. Nice and slow and easy. And you're not going to do this. You're going to always start back at position one because the study was done always starting here in this position and come out. Yes. So, but now you're always going to start here. Extension, extension, grab, twist, twist. Okay, go ahead, twist it first. And then let's bring it out. That's it. Now go ahead. And this is over the area, correct? Correct. Now you come all the way back, you know. No, nope, I want you to start back again. But I, I want you to kind of go 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, about five seconds, if you don't mind. We'll try it. Okay, the web, webcast people, we got about 30 seconds. 30 to seconds. Go. All right. Um, All right, it's my fault. Now, just do something now without it. Let's see if even those three little passes made a difference. What hurts it? Shaking hands or anything? Uh, yeah, a little bit, but not too bad. Does it feel any differently now? It feels looser. Looser. So can you guys continue to work on him? Uh, I think it's very easy. And, it, and by the way, if he does this even without it, if I just have him up here like that and I use my hand here, go ahead now, go down. I want to do it real quickly. But I can go right across there with my hand and a little transverse friction like Syriax's work. So that's fine too. You feel that? Yep. So we can do that too if you don't have an instrument or something like that, and I'm done. Okay. Thank we you all very much for putting up with him. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, for the, the webcast people, uh, we're going to be breaking for lunch. Um, so if you've been cut off, we'll see you in an hour. Uh, guys, if you can just stick around for a sec. Um, uh, okay, uh, um, Dr. Hyde, we apparently have 15 minutes left still on the webcast. Sorry, misinformation there. You want to carry on? Are you done? Oh, no, I could do something we, else. I've got we, a, we, a, okay. So yeah, if, if how about I can, if I do a, a little quick tape job? Okay, so if I can give you another 10, and then the webcast can watch us just do the lucky draw as well. Okay. Okay. Is that okay if I do a tape for you? Uh, could, could somebody ask uh, Ben in his booth if he has a piece of uh, dynamic tape that I could use? And then does anybody want to come up here and let me use their back to do a real quick taping thing I want to show you? Anybody? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on up. This is my friend, I think. Marius. Okay. Now, you've got the SI joint issue, right? Okay. So here's what I need. Yeah, I'm going to get, the, oh, you want to do the dynamic tape? Okay. Well, actually, we can do both. Let's do both with you. All right, so I need you. Are you clean back there now? Is all that emollient off? I just need a dry skin, right? I've got to put the tape on. And I've got the scissors up here somewhere. Yeah, it just needs to be clean and dry. Dry back. Dry back. Oh. Oh, dry back. Yeah, you feel okay. oil. Okay, can you, and you know what, I'll put the tape, if you'll go get that off, I'll do both of you. Okay? Ah. Francois, I know Francois.
<laughs> I, I think I uh, say that again. We met. Oh, we met. We did. We did meet earlier. But I think I sponsored you, didn't I? Yeah, you did. Yes. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Anybody else I can sponsor in here? You're all invited over to my house. Anytime you want to come. Just don't tell my wife. All right, so we're going to do, I'm just going to do a little, how many of you have done SPRT taping? SPRT, do you know what that stands for? This is a specific kind of sports taping that was created by a chiropractor, Tim Brown. And it, uh, it's a little different, so Francois, if you would just, uh, can you take your shirt off? Okay, great. I tell you, <laughs> you guys are fun. Uh, normally I have a, a different tape, but I just happen to have a little of this, so I'm going to try to get rid of it. Do you have any back problems, by the way? Um, no, I, I okay. okay. Do you don't mind if I tape the lower back, do you? I'm just going to round this off a little bit. And I'm going to show you how to use a tab. So let's say that he has problems with, uh, what do you say, extension. All right, he's okay in flexion, but extension bothers him. So I want to aid him in extension. If I have him just, I'm going to have him just slightly flex forward, not very far. And then we're going to, let's say it's somewhere in this region here. So I'm going to come in here like this. I'm going to create a tab on the tape. Show you in a minute why we do it. But I'll just put that like that. We're going to come right across there, grab it, and now I have a tab on there. So this now, I'm going to come down. Let me make that pretty even so it's. I want to go down the direction I want to go here. I'm going to run this right along the erectors. Come up with it here. You see that's just paper off tension, right? Now I'm going to take another piece. You could stand up uh, normally if you don't mind. So now I'm not going to bother to cut the edges off of this, but I'm just take a small piece. It's OK. So now I'm going to come up here. Nope, you're doing great. Just like that. I'm going to put this over. Right over on top of that. Grab this, come down here. Now you know why I'm not using this tape anymore. Go ahead up a little. Just bend forward a little bit. Sorry, I did not say that. I'm going to grab that tab. Okay, so I've I adhered the top layer to that. Let me just go and see if I can get that to stick. Now, once I grab it, I've still got the paper on. I can pull in the direction I want that spine to go. So I'll pull on that, put a little pull. And we're going to come on down. Oops, I want to try to stay on the other piece of tape. Yeah, I should have brought something different, but we'll try. Now, come on up for me. And tell me, do you feel any pull at all? Yeah, a little bit. Can you tell them? Uh, just a little bit. Just a little bit. So I think if I had a different, if I had a different tape, I'd be able to get that much stronger by that using that tab. Does that make sense to you? So I can pull that tab in any direction I want to. If I did the elbow, for an example, and it was bothering him in extension, I could do it in any different way. It doesn't matter. But the idea was to then, again, assist him in coming back into extension with that tab. And then go, go into flexion. Uh, if the webcast people are being cut now, uh, we'll see you oh. in an hour. You can carry on, um, but the webcast is, um, okay. has come down to zero. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, what happens when you go forward? Uh, I feel the pull more. He feels a pull more, like it wants to pull him back up. Is that the way it is? So that's the idea. So we wanted to limit him in flexion, assist him in extension. Does that make sense to you? So that's what the tab can do. And I've used the tab on a lot of different things. 
It works real well. Did we get the, uh, the other tape by any chance? Thank you, Francois. Thank you, Very much. Yes, well, I, uh, hopefully, did, he went out to get the tape, didn't he? Did he go out to Ben? We need to finish. We're done. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Hyde, thank you very much. And we are um, going to have a few more lectures from you. So we uh, do, really do appreciate your time and effort. Thank well, you. You're welcome. That was very interesting. Thank you. It's different. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All right, guys, um, we're going to do a lucky draw for, um, if you can just hold that for me. Um, we're going to do a lucky draw for uh, the jacket. So one of, one of you guys are going to win this. Um, Luke, uh, our vice president, if you want to just come and let's... Uh, anyone. Okay. And if you're not in here, you don't get it. It's, it's just got uh, a surname, and it says Simon, S-A-A-I-M. Not here. She changed the webcast. Okay, that one's going. Okay, oopsie. All right. Manga. There we go, Manga. We're good. If it's not the right size, then uh, we'll uh, just just speak to Bridget up there. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well done. Uh, all right, guys. Um, barcode. Uh, you got to scan uh, out now. And then uh, we've got 58 minutes before we've got to start again. So please uh, don't waste time.